I wanted a track focused supercar, so I went ahead and bought this. My Porsche 911 GT3 RS. But have I made a mistake? You see, maybe I should have gone for something a little bit more exotic and more powerful, like a Lamborghini Aventador SVJ, or perhaps this, a McLaren 765 LT, or maybe a Nissan Nismo GTR, or a Corvette Z06, brilliant value for money, that car, or perhaps I could have gone for Mercedes AMG GT Black Series. Or maybe the Porsche 911 GT3 RS was the right choice, only I should have had it in black. Anyway, we're going to find out which is the best of all the supercars I've just mentioned in this video. I'm Matt Watson, and you're watching Car Wow. The first thing you notice about these track cars are all the extra aero bits. These help produce more downforce, pushing the car into the ground for added grip. And more grip means quicker lap times. I'm going to show you around each car and explain how all the most important aero modifications work. Let's start the front because all these cars have huge front splitters. These push air up and over the car so less of it squeezes underneath the chassis. This reduces lift which helps the car turning more quickly at high speed and it also makes it more stable. These modifications mean each car has a longer nose than its standard counterpart. For example, the front of the McLaren 765LT is almost 5 centimetres longer than the normal 720S. Maybe they should have called it a 765LN for long nose instead of LT, long tail. Anyhow, the Nismo GTR has a load of extra carbon fibre aero at the front too, and I love the Nismo exclusive red pinstripes. The Corvette Z06 also has a very large front splitter, along with loads of extra intakes for its huge new radiators. But Mercedes really pushed the boat out with the AMG GT Black Series. You've got an extendable front splitter. It's not the easiest thing to do. I've got to lie on the floor, pull some levers, and then yank it out like that. Right, so that reduces lift massively at the front, creates quite a bit of downforce. You have to screw little bolts in there and there for when you're on track to add some support for them. Now you can't drive it like that on the road, reason being pedestrian protection. You hit somebody, you are going to shatter their ankles. I think I'll leave that out, it's too much of a faff to put back. I can't really be bothered with all this faff. I don't want to be rebuilding my car each time I want to drive it on track. So it's a good thing the Porsche 911 GT3 RS and Lamborghini Aventador SVJ both have active front aero instead. No spanners required. These active flaps and wings are hidden inside or underneath the car's bodywork, and they automatically adjust the levels of downforce while you are driving. For example, Porsche has designed these wings to make sure the front axle always has 30% of the car's total downforce, and apparently that's what you need for a perfect balance of stability and agility. But that's not the only clever aero feature on the 911 GT3 RS. Here's a man called Rob from Porsche who can help me explain. We have heat management and cooling, that's this bit. This bit here, so carbon fiber bonnet like a GT3, however, you've got all these big cutouts here, and what's, is it, that's not just for show, right? It looks uh, cool. It does look cool, absolutely not for show. Uh, that is to direct the hot air that's coming out the radiator away from the air intakes, which are at the back. Looks pretty mean. Let's move to this bit here. What's going on here? Because this is different than a GT3, isn't it? It doesn't have that. Yeah, correct. It's a lot more like the GT4 RS. So the idea is to create a sort of an air curse. Wait a minute. So you're saying that the, the lesser Cayman has actually influenced the 911. Never before has it been thus. Cayman came first. Oh, it's weird, isn't it? Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> so, uh, so this car is inspired by the Cayman GT4 RS. Okay. Similar principles. Um, so yeah, the principle being is that to try and get the air flowing down the side of the car as smoothly as possible. Okay, so the air goes in there, no fakery there, it's doing a job. But then there's this bit, if we come here, this is where it all gets crazy. Look at this, what's going on with this and this? What's all this? So all of this uh, is to help manage the air that's in the air well. Yeah. So you get a lot of pressure. The air down. well? Uh, in the in the wheel well. Okay, I thought you'd created something new there. No, <laughs> air curtain. But yes, so that will allow the air to come out of the wheel well to like reduce the pressure. Like the old the GT3 pressure. RS. E exactly But the same. this bit it, isn't. Exactly. So that uh, is something that we first saw on our race cars at Le Mans in the late 90s. That really does help the air flow, help bring the air through, helps cool the brakes, helps manage um, the lift that you normally get. 
created by this area. Okay, so when I first saw pictures of this, I was like, mm, it looks a bit busy. Honestly, when you see it for real, like you see part of the cross section of the tires, oh, it just looks so good. The GT3 RS isn't the only car with these wheel arch vents. There are some on the GTR Nismo too and the AMG GT Black Series and the McLaren 765 LT. And they all work in the same way. They help high pressure air escape from the wheel wells so it doesn't produce additional lift. But there's another feature these cars have to reduce lift. Yes, I am of course talking about their massive rear wings. Look at this, this is huge. The biggest ever wing fitted to a Porsche road car. Yeah, I mean, it's not just the area, which is, yeah, as you say, significantly bigger than anything we fitted yet. Uh, it's active as well. Mm -hmm. So you have this element on the top, yep. uh, is able to move, so you see the hydraulic activation yep. uh, that works on that. Wow. Um, so the rear wing is fully active. It can act as an air brake. Uh -huh. um, it can create additional downforce. Um, and you have DRS, which is the same sort of thing that you find on a Formula One car. This giant wing helps the GT3 RS produce a total of 860 kilograms of downforce at 177 miles an hour. That's three times more than the downforce you get on a normal 911 GT3. That's the same as carrying 10 fully grown German men in your car. And trust me, they won't fit. But the GT3 RS isn't the only car with heavyweight downforce numbers. Check out the AMG GT Black Series. The key thing on this car, obviously, is this new big rear wing. So you can actually adjust it manually. However, the center part here moves automatically depending on which driving mode you're in, and it can alter its angle by 20 degrees. Say if you're cornering or braking, it'll stick up more. If you're going high speed, then it'll go flat for reduced drag. This offers proper downforce. I'll show you now, look at this, right? There are special braces in here attached to the chassis, which press down on there because that can produce so much pressure on the back of the car. But how much pressure are we talking? Well, at 155 miles an hour, you get an extra 400 kilograms of downforce from all the GT's fancy aero upgrades. This increases to around 800 kilograms when you hit the car's 202 mile an hour top speed. The McLaren 765LT also has an active rear wing as part of that car's long tail makeover. However, it's more of a grower than a shower compared with its German counterparts. Here at the back, you've got a new rear bumper, a new extended rear diffuser, which helps reduce turbulence and improve aerodynamics. And the back end of this car actually sticks out nine millimeters more than that of the 720s so it's increased slightly though it's funny that they call it a long tail yeah it's actually the front which has been extended further but hey anyway there's a tail haha <laughs> to tell about these bits here that have been added on now what they do is square off the back end of the car apparently the car's aero would be better if the back end was completely square but the engineers say that while well, they'd like to do that it wouldn't look so aesthetically pleasing and this is a real nice rear end isn't it especially with this extra mesh that fitted to the car here which all helps improve cooling and airflow and then there's the wing it's 20 percent larger than on the 720s in fact it's so large they've had to put a little cutout in it there so that when it's sticking up you can still see out of your rear view mirror see you've just overtaken also this wing sticks up even further when you're in normal racing mode and combined with all the other aero stuff it helps provide 200 kilos of downforce at 150 miles an hour, which is 25% more downforce than you get on the 720S. But not all active rear wings were created equal. Lamborghini went for a very different approach with the SVJ. That car's huge wing is fixed, just like the carbon wings you get on the GTR Nismo and Corvette Z06. But active vents in the Lambo's bodywork can alter the airflow before it even reaches the rear wing. In top speed configuration, these flaps can stall the airflow over the wing so it produces less downforce. Less downforce means less drag, and less drag means a higher top speed. That sounds pretty geeky to be honest. And it reminds me of a famous quote from Enzo Ferrari who said, Aerodynamics are for people who can't build the engines. Sorry, that was a dreadful accent. Anyway, 
Lamborghini can definitely build engines. In fact, I think the SVJ has one of the greatest car engines ever made. You are looking at one of the main reasons to buy a Lamborghini Aventador. It's 6.5 litre, naturally aspirated V12. Now in the standard car, it puts out 730 horsepower. But here in the SVJ, you have 770 horsepower and 720 newton metres of torque. And look at this, you got the firing order there. 112, 4, 9, 2, 11, 6, 7, 3, 10, 5, 8 gives it a unique sound. So shall we experience it? Go on, start it up. Wow. Let's have some friends. Wait, stop, 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 that's enough. You can cut it, you can cut it. Otherwise, no one will hear me. Now, this engine is mated to a seven-speed, single-clutch, robotized manual gearbox, but it does have launch control, so let's use it. Wait, wait, wait. Before I launch the SVJ, you need to know about all the other engines in these cars. So, let's check out the 911 GT3 RS. I've got Rob again from Porsche to explain it to us. Now, like with my 996, there's a flap you can open to see the engine, isn't there? Good job it's PPF'd. Um, anyway, it's, it's quite a small little... Why don't they let you see the engine? Flat six, Matt. Keeps the weight low. Uh, I hate that. Anyway, tell me about the engine itself. So the engine's very similar to the GT3. Produces about 15 horsepower more, so 510 horsepower in the GT3. Uh, we've got 525 horsepower in this. Good, good. What about torque? Is that up as well? Torque is just a little bit down, so engine characteristics have been reprofiled um, more for the racetrack. What do you mean, down? Well, the peak number is a little bit lower. We're only talking five, six Newton meters, but the torque profile is still really, really strong. And the idea being is that the main range that you would use this in on track would be that sort of six to 9,000 RPM range. So between peak torque and peak power. But there's less torque. I mean, there is a little bit less torque, but there's all sorts of other things that have been put into the engine to help it for the racetrack application. For example, with all the G-forces that this car can pull, nearly 2G on the circuit, the oil gets pushed around, um, so the cylinder heads have all been redesigned with the oil channels to make sure that the oil's getting pushed to exactly where it needs to be all of the time. Okay, so um, I just get and launch it then, yeah? Matt, it's a race car. It's all about the corners. Okay, you don't want me to launch it? It's cornering, Matt. Okay, so um, I definitely won't be launching this then. Nah, of course I will. But before we get to that, what does this flat six sound like? You know what people might think that the GT3 RS has a soft limit and it sort of does look, can't rev past 4,000, oh dear. <laughs> However, those in the know, know that with a GT car, you put it into drive, pull up both paddles and then your soft limiter has increased to 6,000 RPM. Not quite the full 9,000, but better than most cars anyway. Now let's move on to the Nissan GTR Nismo. This is a 3.8 litre twin turbo V6. It's been hand built by one of only five master craftsmen in the world qualified to work on the car. It has 650 newton meters of torque, 600 horsepower, really impressive. And it sounds like this. Soft limiter. Oh, still a few pops and bangs when you lift off. Not terrible. Let's up the ante with some proper hard hitting V8, like the one you get in the AMG GT Black Series. So you have Mercedes familiar 4 litre twin turbo V8, but it's been heavily reworked. New larger turbochargers, larger intercooler. You've also got an angled radiator for improved cooling, and these vents here, which help channel air over the turbochargers to keep them cool. Inside the engine, you've got new camshafts. You've also got a new crankshaft. So instead of a cross plane crank, which is at 90 degrees, you have a flat plane crank, which is at 180 degrees, which is like a Ferrari. They've also changed the firing order as well. Now all these changes add up to some big power gains. So this engine produces 730 horsepower and 800 newton meters of torque. That's 145 more horsepower than the GTR Pro and 100 newton meters more torque. To cope with all that extra torque, Mercedes has had to beef up the car's seven speed dual clutch transmission. They've also changed the launch control system to make it even more brutal. AMG says this car did 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds and top speed is 200 and one miles an hour. But what does that new flat plane crank V8 sound like? Oh, that's 
not great. Perhaps the McLaren can come to the rescue with a 765 LT and its V8. It's a four litre twin turbo that produces 765 horsepower and 800 newton meters of torque. That's the same amount of torque as the Black Series, but 35 more horses. And this is what it sounds like. Oh, I can feel all those vibrations through my bum. It's a bit weird, but I like it. But will I like the Corvette Z06 even more? After all, if there's one thing that the Americans know, it's how to make a V8 sound good. But Chevrolet has gone all European with the new C8 Z06, and not just because the engine is in the middle of the car instead of at the front. The big news about the Z06 version of the Corvette is that it has an all new 5.5 litre natural aspirated V8 engine. Wait a minute, it's a slightly smaller engine than the 6.2 in a standard car. However, it produces more power. So the standard C8 has 495 horsepower. This Z06 has 670 horsepower. It's a massive increase. Also, unlike the standard car, which has a cross plane crank like most other US V8s, this has a flat plane crank like a Ferrari. That seems very promising, but I know the Z06 has a soft limiter. So how does that affect the sound it makes when you're revving it while stationary. Sounds promising with that sports exhaust, but there's a trick. Pull in both paddles and you can rev it all the way up. Go on, Jesse, let me... Now that is the sound of a flat playing crank. And it definitely sounds better than the turbocharged cars from McLaren, Mercedes and Nissan. Want to sell your car quickly, easily, and for a fair price? Then head to CarWow to have over 4,000 trusted dealers ready to bid on it in an online auction. First, enter your car's registration to get an instant approximate valuation. Then, if you want to proceed, give us some more details and upload some photos, and we'll help you set a fair reserve price for your car. That's the minimum amount you'd be happy to sell it for. Once you've done that, we'll enter your car into an online auction. When the auction's over, we'll let you know the result, and the dealer with the winning bid will be in touch to arrange easy payment and free collection of your car. 93% of sellers surveyed said they got the price they expected, or more, through CarWow. The best bit is, it's completely free. I put a link in the description of this video and the pinned comment to take you directly to CarWow, where over 4,000 dealers are ready to bid on your car. Or you can just click on the pop-out banner that should be appearing in the top right-hand corner of the screen now. Alternatively, just Google Help Me CarWow, and we will help you sell your car quickly, easily, and for a fair price. On with the video. Anyway, that's enough about the sound of the engines. Let's see how they actually perform by doing some 0 to 60 tests. This big bad Lambo is supposed to do 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds, but what will it do? I'm going to use my specialist timing gear here to measure it. I know these launch in such a brutal way. Oh. <laughs> I feel so bad for the mechanics on the car because it just drops its clutch and yeah, let's see what happens. Let's do it. Can't figure out how to do it. Corsa, ESC, off. There we go. Now let's do it. Whoa, the gear changes. Hot. 3.07. What's the quarter mile? 10.8. It was a bit of a stuttery launch. Oh, but it's so, so bad for the car. <laughs> That single clutch dropped, the wheel spin a bit, and depending on your traction levels, that's your two tenths right there. Do I think it can do 2.8? Yes, it can if you get a slightly better launch, but I'm not doing it again because I just have too much mechanical sympathy. Now, electric cars, the way they launch and push it back in your seat is incredible, but there's something about this, the way all that energy just goes to the drivetrain, the way you get those jolts when it changes gear, the noise, that <laughs> of the engine. Oh, it's just so much. And your senses struggle to just take it all in that it all just becomes a bit of a blur. 
But that's not all. The best quarter mile time I've ever had from an SVJ was in a drag race against a Ferrari 812 and a Porsche 911 Turbo S. It's at a time of 10.4 seconds. But how will this time compare to the McLaren 765LT? After all, that car's supposed to do 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds, which is exactly the same as Lamborghini claims for the SVJ. We're in launch mode, full throttle, boost building, boost is ready, release brake. Off we go. Oh, I struggle with traction. Oh, mate, I'm there in second and third. This thing is just flying. My God. Oh. Wow. Well, that was certainly very, very quick. Traction was a bit of an issue. The surface is a little bit damp, but once this thing hooked up, you could just see the numbers on the speedo just taking off. Another thing to point out is that it actually has a shorter final drive than the normal 720, which helps with the acceleration. And it's got a closer ratio gearbox as well. It isn't surprising that this McLaren hits the numbers. I've drag raced one and it managed to beat the all conquering 911 Turbo S. It did the standing quarter mile in an incredible 10 seconds flat. But I'm really interested to see what the Corvette Z06 will manage because Chevrolet says it accelerates even quicker than the McLaren. Apparently the Corvette Z06 should do 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds. I'm not so sure though, so I'm gonna test it with my specialist timing gear. Here we go. Oh, slow get away. It's like it's managing the power. Not even close, four point, what's that, 4.18? You could tell that in launch control mode, even though you got the stability and traction like off, it's managing the power to prevent slip and that pull away was just so subdued. It feels much quicker once it's going than that number suggests. Let's have another go. What I'm going to do now is ignore launch control. So I'm going to change it up a bit. Going to go into a slightly different setting. Still with the traction control off, but I'm going to manage the power myself. So hold on the brake and then go for it. Is that quicker? 3.84. I reckon it might be able to go quicker still. Certainly nowhere near 2.6 yet though, are we? One last go, bit more brake boosting. Was that better? Yeah, it was. 3.61, that's a whole second slower than it's supposed to do. To be fair, I wasn't launching the Z06 on a very good surface, but even when I drag raced it on a runway against a Ford GT, it still only managed a quarter mile time in 11.2 seconds. That's significantly slower than the McLaren. Now let's see how the AMG GT Black Series measures up. Mercedes says it'll do 0 to 60 miles an hour in 3.2 seconds, but how quick is it in reality? Restart, lower revs a bit, lower them a bit. Release brake, here we go. It's off now, took a wee while. 3.47 to 60, where's the standing quarter? 1088 on the standing quarter. Let's give it another go. <laughs> Here we are. No, oh, it's on it now. That's good. Woohoo! 3.13 to 60. 10.6 quarter mile. And I reckon it'll go quicker, but I haven't got time today. Oh, that's brutal. That means the Black Series is the first car here that's managed to beat its manufacturer's claimed 0 to 60 mile an hour time. But I have high hopes for the next car, the 911 GT3 RS. Porsches always seem to overperform when I test them. So can this GT3 RS beat the manufacturer's claimed 0 to 60 mile an hour time of 3.2 seconds? More traction issues. 60, 3.65, so it's been 3.2. What's the quarter mile? 11.58. Now, Rob from Porsche did say that this car isn't about like launching in straight line speed and stuff like that. So I think we better do it again. Okay, what I'm gonna do this time is turn my little traction control button to reduce the traction control, but keep the stability control on. That's better. 3.19, yes! What's the quarter mile? 11.19. 
I think I'm going to launch this car one more time because the man from Porsche would clearly want me to. Now though, I'm going to put the stability control into dynamic mode, which lets me turn the traction control all the way down to one. So it shouldn't interfere as much as it did last time on the launch. Maybe I'll get a better time. Let's find out. Here we go. That was better. Oh, yes. 3.14. Yes, it was better. What's the quarter mile? 11.14. No surprise there then. I told you Porsches always overperform. Although the actual time was still a hundredth of a second slower than the Black Series. In case you're wondering what the Porsche's best quarter mile time is, well, here you go. Pretty impressive, really. But there's still one car left to test, the Nissan GTR Nismo. I've left this car to last because Nissan claims it will do 0 to 60 in just 2.5 seconds. That's the quickest claim figure of any car here. But what's the reality? Oh, struggles for grip, you know. 0 to 60, 2.99 seconds. What's the standing quarter mile? 10.94. Traction wasn't great away from the lines. Give it another go. All right, Godzilla, you gotta do a better job this time for the well being of all the GTR fanboys watching, okay? Otherwise, in the comments, they'll be getting saltier than a tin of anchovies washed down with a glass of seawater. You got this. We're going sideways a bit again. Oh, not 60, 2.96 seconds. That's a standing quarter, 10.92. Oh well, there we go. You had your chance, you blew it. Okay, okay, just one more go, let's do it. That hook better, that hook better. Oh yes, 2.89 to 60. I'm a bottle of standing quarter though because this is too quick into this corner. <laughs> 2.89, it hooked. I don't think I'm gonna get much better than that and I definitely don't think I'm going to do a 2.5. Hopefully the fanboys aren't too salty now. Maybe just like a bag of crisps. Okay, so it didn't quite match the claim figure, but it's still quicker than an SVJ, the Z06, the AMG GT Black Series, and the 911 GT3 RS. And here it is over the stunning quarter mile. And the most incredible thing about the GTR Nismo is that it's the only car here with some back seats. And that leads me on to comparing these cars' interiors, starting with the carbon-covered Nissan GTR Nismo. So, there is more carbon fibre in here. Yes, got the door open, thanks for telling me, Nissan. Most notably, here, look, we've got carbon-backed bucket seats. They are lovely, made by Recaro, exclusive to the Nismo GTR and they hold your body so very well. There's also carbon fiber here on the center console and a Nismo badge there. You've got Alcantara on the steering wheel with this center marker. There's also Alcantara on the dash, that's lovely. And Alcantara for the roof lining, which is also lovely. Then there's some red stitching to signify that you're in the Nismo version. You've got Nismo on the rev counter and it's a red rev counter. If I'm brutally honest with you, this car is feeling its age on the inside. No place is that more evident than this infotainment system. It's horrible. It's just so slow, laggy. The graphics are really low def and it hasn't even got Android Auto. Apple CarPlay, yes, but no Android. Anyway, let's move on to the back. Let's see what it's like. It's not gonna be great, is it? Here in the back of the GTR. Um, let me just move this out of the way so you can see what's happening. I'm gonna do, oh God, I'm gonna have to shut this door. Oh. Shut up. Let's see what knee room's like. I'm just gonna pull this back and hope I don't crush my knees. Come on. Oh, actually I have just about got enough knee room, a finger's worth, but it does feel like my legs are trapped. I can hardly move them. So if you had to go any kind of distance, you're gonna end up with a deep vein thrombosis. And then headroom, you can see for yourself. I don't need to explain that, do I? And it's not great having your head against the back window. But you don't buy a Nismo GTR to be giving passengers a lift. It's not an Uber car, is it? Okay, so none of these track-focused supercars would make good taxes, but it's still nice to have the option of a few back seats. One of the great things about the Porsche 911 is that it's a sports car that has some rear seats, which you can use occasionally. The problem with the GT3 and the GT3 RS is that they've been removed. Hmm, so it's just a two-seater. Still, you can store some luggage here if you want to. Well, so long as you haven't got the Visac pack and this cage, because it's much harder to put luggage in here. And that's especially a problem on this car because, unlike the GT3, 
the GT3 RS doesn't have a front boot because it's taken up with these new radiators. But I'm definitely not going to use my 911 GT3 RS to move passengers around. I'm more concerned about what it's like in the driver's seat. And it's off to a very good start because the RS comes with loads of upgrades that you don't get on the standard 911 or the normal, if you can call it that, GT3. So you get GT3 RS badging on the kick plates. You have GT3 RS logo here and a picture of the car from the side profile. You get this yellow surround for the rev counter. You also get this unique steering wheel with these extra buttons on. You also get this unique door paneling there and here. Plus, you get little fabric poles to open the door. And you don't have another door pocket there. You actually have a net because weight saving. Another thing the GT3 RS has is common fibre here and here. Though you can actually get that on the GT3, but you have to pay extra for it. Likewise, the GT3, you have to pay extra for an Alcantara dash. You don't in the GT3 RS. The GT3 RS also gets Sport Chrono as standard. You also get these lovely carbon fibre back bucket seats as standard on the GT3 RS, whereas they're extra on the GT3. They're just like the GT3, you do have the gear selector knob rather than the little toggle thing that you have on the normal 911, 992 generation. The AMG GT Black Series takes a very similar approach to interior design. It's more lightweight than luxury. Here on the inside, you get the usual AMG Sports steering wheel with the selectable drive modes here. However, it says AMG Black Series on it in this car, and the rim is trimmed in fake suede. In fact, there's fake suede everywhere on this car, which is really nice, and on the doors. Speaking of which, the door cards are made of lightweight material, so that helps save weight on the car, and you don't have door handles, you just have pulls because that also saves weight. You've also got carbon fibre sill plates. Lovely. You probably notice the carbon fibre bucket seats. Really, really nice. And in this car, they have orange stripes on them. And you also get orange stitching about the place as well. Though you can switch that out for grey stitching if that's a bit too in your face. Now in the UK, we get the track pack as standard and that includes the roll cage. There's also a fire extinguisher in here somewhere. I don't know where. It also includes four-point racing harness. These three track models are all based on relatively normal cars. The Nissan GTR, the Porsche 911, and the Mercedes MGT. But what sort of interior do you get when a maker turns an all-out supercar into a track special? Like what McLaren did when it made the 720S into the 765LT. Well, it turns out McLaren is pretty obsessed with weight saving. Here's what I mean. So the 765LT gets carbon fiber racing seats. And they're the ones that you get in the center that they do have a unique pattern for this car. And they save 18 kilos. The glass for the windscreen and the side windows is slightly thinner. And at the back here, that's polycarbonate. Yeah, it sounds cheap, but it's actually expensive. And it saves in total that six kilos. A further 2.5 kilos has been saved by building this central tunnel and the door cards out of carbon fiber and getting rid of the normal door pockets and replacing them with this elasticated Ouch. Wait a minute, there's no floor carpets in here. What kind of poverty spec is this? Oh, I know, it saves 2.4 kilos. Deletion of the audio system saves 1.5 kilos. And if you remove the air conditioning, that saves 10 kilos. Though if you're a wuss, you can actually have them put back in. I can accept some weight saving measures, but there are other things in the 765 LT that really wind me up. The way these seats protrude here, it's easy to just bang your elbow on it. I just did it and caught my funny bone so, so badly. I've got electric hand now and I can't even feel my little finger. <sighs> this is McLaren's older infotainment system. You get a new one in things like the GT. Quite frankly, it's a bit crap. Look at this rear view mirror. It's just so horrible and cheap, like something out of a Dacia, not a McLaren supercar. I mean, come on guys, spend some money on the mirror. There's no glove box. Surely there's space for one there. I know it's a super sports car, but still, what about your racing gloves? There is no doubt that McLaren has sacrificed a few creature comforts to make the 765LT as light 
as possible. But Lamborghini hasn't been quite so stingy. In fact, the SVJ's interior feels more dramatic than the standard Aventador's. This Lamborghini feels like a proper supercar here on the inside. You've got this massive expansive dash, loads of texture to it. It's all very angled, a huge center console separating you from your passenger. You're sitting on the floor almost. And look at this, this little red cover for the start button. It's like the cover you'd have on the missile launcher on a fighter jet. I mean, you really do feel like you're in a cockpit right here. It's a lovely steering wheel. It's got quite a sense of occasion to it, this car. I love the huge gear shifter paddles as well, your aluminium pedals. I like the way you open the door. So you press this button here and it just lowers the window slightly. And then you pull that one and push the door up. And then there's this handy handle for shutting it as well. Now this SVJ gets loads of extra carbon fiber about the place. There's Alcantara everywhere, white stitching, white piping, more Alcantara on the roof lining and more white piping and some leather here as well. Best bit, SVJ seats, like you've got SVJ logo on them there, they're carbon fiber backed and they are really comfy. You've got Alcantara on the steering wheel as well and the dead ahead marker on it. It's a really nice place to sit, it really is. But it's not that practical. There is no glove box. There are no door bins. I suppose when you open the door, things will drop out. Anyway, there are no cup holders. There's no excuse for that. I mean, where are you supposed to put your coffee? The only storage area I've found is this little net behind here. That's it. Oh, and there's a place here for your mobile phone. Let you put your mobile phone in there. Look, they're my big mobile phone. Look, look, this one won't fit. Uh, maybe it'll fit if I open it like that. There we go, yeah, that, that might fit. How do you fit? Come on, fit. Fit. It fits, yeah, but still. <laughs> That's a lot. So practicality wasn't high up on Chevrolet's priorities for the Corvette Z06 either. But at least you get some cup holders under a flap in the center console, like in the regular C8. The rest of the cabin is pretty similar to that car too. But there are a couple of important changes. So the Z06 gets its own bespoke steering wheel. It's still hexagonal like the normal car, but it says Z06 on it. And you can upgrade it to have carbon fiber on it and carbon fiber shifter paddles. You also get upgraded sport seats so they're called the gt2 bucket seat and they're really quite nice and they have a bit of carbon fiber on them but if you want to you can pay extra to have the sport competition seats which are even more aggressive and body hugging other changes include z06 on the kick plates and um that's about it really there's something else about the z06 which is very interesting you've probably already spotted it. That's right, you can get the Z06 as a convertible, but it isn't the only car that comes with an optional drop top. You can also get the Aventador SVJ as a roadster and the McLaren 765LT comes as a spider. So if you're looking for a track car that lets you feel the wind in your helmet, these cars are the way to go. Personally, however, I prefer my track cars with a roof. A solid roof helps make the car lighter and stiffer and all that helps improve your lap time car makers have spent millions of pounds upgrading these exact components for their hardcore track cars why wouldn't you take advantage of this buying a convertible supercar to take on track is like getting taylor swift tickets and watching the whole gig on your phone pointless anyway let's get back to the cars because i'm more interested in the chassis and suspension upgrades on these hardcore supercars and let's start with the car i actually bought myself the GT3 RS sits 20 millimeters lower to the ground than a standard Carrera, much in the same way that a GT3 does. However, the RS has 50% stiffer springs because of all its extra downforce and uprated dampers. Like the GT3, you have 20 inch alloys at the front and 21s at the rear. However, the tires are wider. Instead of 315 sections, you've got 335 millimeters. Just look at the size of those tires. Just like the GT3, the RS gets solid suspension bushings for increased precision. Also like that car, it has the double wishbone suspension at the front. You know, a bit like a Mazda MX-5 has had since 1989. However, obviously the Porsche is a little bit more expensive and firmer and better obviously. Now what is different on the GT3 RS's suspension though is that the wishbones themselves have been designed to produce downforce and they produce 40 kilos of downforce. It's nuts. Another thing they've done on this car is change the location of the lower wishbone arm to reduce diving under braking. 
Just like the GT3, the RS model has rear axle steering and an electronically controlled limited slip differential to send power to the wheel with the most grip. Then there's the fact that Porsche actually increased the track for the RS model, so it's 29 millimeters wider both at the back and the front. Finally, the brakes, just like with the GT3, you have 408 millimeter discs up front gripped by six piston calipers, whereas at the back, you've got 380 millimeter discs gripped by four piston calipers. However, for the RS, the brake discs themselves are slightly thicker and the pistons and the calipers have been upgraded. Now, if you want to, you can upgrade to these carbon ceramic brakes for 6,000 pounds, which is what this car has. You get yellow calipers then, well worth it. Mercedes has fitted the AMG GT Black Series with upgraded wheels and brakes. But unlike with the Porsche, you actually have to manually adjust the car's suspension yourself, like an actual race mechanic with tools. Like on a GTR Pro, you can adjust the camber of the wheels at the front and the back, only you can adjust them by a lot more, so up to three and a half degrees, which is quite a lot. Just like with the GTR Pro, you have adjustable anti-roll bars at the front and the back. The front one is carbon fiber and the rear one is hollow steel. Unlike the GTR Pro, the dampers in the Black Series are electronically adjustable, so you can tweak those settings while you're driving. There are three setups to choose from, Comfort, Sport and Sport Plus. Now the dampers are completely different than on the normal GTR and they're much more sporty focused, so the setup is firmer and more aggressive. Now there is something you can adjust manually and that's a ride height and you can change it by up to 15 millimeters depending on the driving conditions. Unlike Mercedes, McLaren won't let you fiddle around with any of the 765LT suspension geometry or ride height, but you can get some pretty crazy upgrades for that car. And the one that really blew my mind is the brake upgrade from the McLaren Senna. So you get the monoblock six piston calipers from the Senna and they have a special little vent on them which sends air across the front and round the back to cool the pads. Obviously you get carbon ceramic discs as standard, but if you pay extra you can get the discs off the Senna. So they take six months to make. Four months of that, they are in an oven at a thousand degrees to help them cure. As a result, they can resist fade by up to four times as much as normal carbon ceramic disc brakes. But that's not all. Here's what else McLaren changed about the 720S when it made the 765LT. The steering system has a quicker ratio with a stiffer torsion bar for improved responsiveness. The car suspension system has been reworked, so the active dampers and active anti-roll system has been recalibrated. You've got stiffer springs all round. At the front, it rides five millimetres low to the ground. The track is also wider by six millimetres here at the front, and all that helps improve the grip, as does the fact you now get Pirelli Trofeo R tyres as standard. The GTR was a true supercar killer when it arrived back in 2007, and this Nismo version is more high-tech than ever but it still retains a few quirks from the original 2007 R35. And I'm not talking about the infotainment system. The steering has hydraulic rather than electric power assistance, so it has a heavy old school feel. And the Nismo also keeps the standard car's unusual transaxle gearbox layout. This takes power from the engine and sends it all the way to the back wheels first. Then it splits some of this power to the front wheels using a completely separate drive shaft. It's weird, it's complex, but it works. There's also a few upgrades in this Nismo you don't get with the standard GTR. What you see here are the largest brakes ever fitted to a Japanese production car. You got 410 millimeter carbon ceramic disc gripped by six piston calipers. At the back, you got 390 millimeter carbon ceramic discs gripped by four piston calipers. Also, the Nismo version of the GTR gets these special Dunlop tires, which have been specifically produced for this very car. The Nismo gets uprated Bill Stein three mode adaptive dampers as standard. The Nismo version of the GTR has a recalibrated six speed dual clutch automatic gearbox for even quicker shifts over the standard GTR. The body panels have been given some extra bonding to make them stiffer, more rigid. As a result, the Nismo GTR's body is 10% stiffer than the standard car to make it more responsive and improve the handling and all that kind of stuff. These upgrades seem small when you look at them individually, but they're supposed to completely transform the car when you add them all together. It's a similar story when you look at the upgrade Chevrolet made to the Corvette when it developed this Z06. So you've got a wider track, you've got wider tyres, you've also got upgraded suspension, which is 30% stiffer than standard. You've got beefier anti-roll bars and they've altered the geometry to make it more aggressive. And they didn't ignore the brakes either. The Z06 gets upgraded brakes over the standard C8 Corvette. 
the front, you have 370 millimeter discs gripped by six piston calipers. And at the rear, you have 380 millimeter discs gripped by four piston calipers. Now, unlike the standard C8, the Z06 can be upgraded with carbon ceramics, which this car has. And then you have 400 millimeter discs at the front and 390 millimeters at the rear. But how do you upgrade a supercar that's already supposed to be one of the very best high performance machines ever made? I'm talking, of course, about the Lamborghini Aventador. Well, Lamborghini took a less is more approach for the SVJ version. It made a few small tweaks instead of massive sweeping changes. A bit like swapping red peppers for green peppers on a pizza, rather than adding a load of pineapple. I actually like pineapple on a pizza, but that's just me. The SVJ has a few suspension changes over the standard Aventador. So the anti-roll bars are 50% stiffer. Also the active dampers, which let you choose between a softer and a harder setting, have been recalibrated for a more sporty drive. Don't know what the accent was all about. This car has variable ratio steering, which is designed to make it feel responsive without being twitchy at high speeds. You also get rear wheel steering, so the rear wheels will turn the same direction as the fronts when you're going quicker to help the car turn into a corner, whereas when you're going slowly, they turn in the opposite direction a bit like a forklift truck to help make it a bit more maneuverable and the rear wheel string on the SVJ is tweaked to work with the active aero to make it even more dynamic. This car has a limited slip differential on the rear axle for better corner exiting traction. Also the four-wheel drive system has been tweaked slightly for this SVJ so you now have three percent more torque going to the back wheels. Bet you can really feel that. Let's find out. Let's take it for a drive. Let's experience this Aventador SVJ. Oh my God. <laughs> Obviously that engine dominates the whole experience. I remember driving just the standard Aventador and it felt more cumbersome and leaden footed than this thing. The steering is super sharp. Actually the agility as well, the way it turns in. It's quite remarkable for such a big car like this. Oh my gosh. The rear wheel steering is definitely helping. And the suspension changes and upgrades for the SVJ. Oof. This is a visceral experience though. It's not a relaxing drive. <laughs> wow. Those gear changes, downshifts are good. The upshifts can be a bit jerky. There's a little bit of a knack to it. You sort of want to lift off when you're changing, so I'm accelerating. Hey, you can smooth them out, otherwise you're not like jerking about in the place and you get out the road like that. Whoa! I mean, such a thing, this. My goodness. Wow! When you're hitting it around, this thing, oh, it's got performance, it's got the grip. It's surprisingly agile and it does move around a bit underneath you. It feels a lot less inert than a normal Aventador. It's sort of playful, yet you still got that brilliant traction from the four wheel drive system. Loads of grip from those huge tires. And all the time you're being serenaded by that beautiful, beautiful engine. Sometimes though, when you're not hooning it, you're just gonna wanna cruise around. So I'm gonna put it into Strada, which I believe is Italian for street. If it's wrong, tell me in the comments. Okay, so it's gonna do its own thing now. It's still an event. You do pick up the bumps in the road, but they're not terrible. And these seats, they're actually pretty comfy. I could definitely do some miles in it. Let's put it into automatic mode for the gearbox as well. For just cruising around, it's fine. The only major problems are just the sheer size of it. So it's super wide. And then there's the visibility, which is really awful, especially out of that back window. But I can live with it. It's comfy enough. It's not too intrusive. It's not too hard work. What I think. So if the wild looking SVJ is actually relatively easy to drive, how does the relatively subtle looking GTR Nismo compare? Finally then, let's see what this GTR Nismo is like to drive. Well, it's a little bit like this. Oh God! Oh. <laughs> May have sounded like I was having a slightly painful orgasm, <laughs> but that pretty much sums up this car. In fact, let's have a multiple one. So, oh, it's nuts! First thing, this engine. So, what I didn't tell you about the engine earlier is that the turbochargers come from the GT racing car, and they just spool up so quick. So, watch this. Second gear, around 3,000 RPM on straight away, on way, here we go again. My goodness. The engine is lovely. I've always loved the engine of the GTR and in this Nismo, it's especially good. Oh, it's just the thrust you get from it. 
nuts. Now all of that would count for nothing if this thing was just all like kind of point and squirt, but it's not the feel you get through it. Through your bottom, you know how much grip it's got and it will move around beneath you, but it gives you so much confidence <laughs> to just... God, I just realized how quick I was going then. You go around corners in this car so much quicker than you ever thought you could do. And there's so much confidence from that steering, which is just so pointy and sharp. It's hydraulically assisted. None of your electrical nonsense of most modern cars. And as a result, it feels pure, you feel connected. It's starting to get the price, 180,000 pounds. I'm driving on a closed road, but it's actually a test track. And I can experience the performance here, really enjoy this car. And you can feel the differences then between the Nismo version and the normal car when you're really pushing it, because it's set up so well, this thing. On the road though, hard to tell the difference and really feel the benefits of the Nismo because speed limits, 70 miles an hour. This thing, just 70 miles an hour without even thinking about it. Once again, revving the, the change of gear. Look at that, it's just boom, boom, boom. That's how you really appreciate a dual clutch automatic compared to say some of these tall converter automatics that BMW is putting into its latest M cars. You do just get that rifle bomb chase, bang, bang, bang. It's so intense. <laughs> Godzilla really is a proper, proper animal. So I'm gonna back it off a bit. This is where you feel that it's a bit archaic, a bit old fashioned. So the Bilstein dampers in this car actually make it feel a bit more sophisticated over bumps like round town and the standard GTR. It's firm and you get jostled about, then have speed dumps, but there's a real delicacy to the way it just irons out the small imperfections. It doesn't fidget too much, firm but fair, excessively firm, but still sort of fair. It's probably the best way to sum it up but it does get tiring after a while. Another thing that gets tiring is the turning circle, which is awful. Then there's all the mechanical noises, which I really do like. You put it into gear, it's like the clunking of the disc when you're moving around. You still hear a little bit. It's not as bad as on the early GTRs. And you get out on the motorway and this thing's just like droning on and droning on. And... I could also drone on about the other ways this car feels a bit old, but it's still one of the most capable performance cars I've ever driven, even if it is a bit rough around the edges. Surprisingly, despite its blue collar roots, the new Corvette Z06 is the complete opposite. Okay, let's take this for a spin. Not a spin. I don't want to spin. Oh my gosh, the engine. <laughs> oh, you can just play with it with all the noise. <laughs> you can play with it the same way you can play with the Porsche GT3 engine. Just makes such a great sound. It's so revvy, very responsive. Maybe not quite as hardcore, like angry as a GT3's engine, but oh, lovely. What's noticeably better than a GT3 though? The suspension. Well, on the road anyway. I've got it in sport mode, which is the middle setting, and it's just going over these bumps brilliantly. That is so impressive, and that will mean that it's actually really, really easy to control on a bumpy, twisty country road in the UK. Porsche skips about all over the place. Obviously, on these roads out here, it's a little bit difficult to assess the car's handling, I'm afraid. It's very straight, not many corners. Need to head off somewhere, find some canyon roads. Unfortunately, I just don't have the time today, which is a real shame because I've heard great things about the handling of this car. Very balanced, very predictable, very stable. I mean, this is the only corner I've got here. Whoa! Oh, there's another one going to the right, but yeah, again. Oh, the steering's very sharp and it feels so planted. <laughs> this engine is a screamer. It feels really, really responsive, really, really easy to drive. The only thing that I've got a little bit of a problem with, and it's minor, the brakes just feel a little bit over assisted at the top part of the pedal, so you just brush them and it's almost like you're doing a full emergency stop. I'd like a bit more progression. It's really my only complaint. Other than that, it's docile, yet clearly quite bonkers as well. I can't quite get the seat low enough to stop the buffeting at the top of my hair. It's like the wind just whizzes off the top of the windscreen and my hair's just going like crazy. I actually find it quite pleasant. It's a bit like having a head massage. Oh. <laughs> but I'm gonna look a little bit disheveled after this. 
thing absolutely flies. The Corvette Z06 might seem a little tame compared to some of these other cars, but there is a good reason for that. There's a brand new ZR1 model in the works, and you know Chevrolet is taking it seriously because there's a prototype being tested around the Nürburgring. I can't wait to get hold of that car and see how it compares to these other track cars. But before that happens, let's jump from a brand new model to something a bit more old school, the AMG GT Black Series. This hardcore front engine supercar is no spring chicken. The original AMG GT came out about 10 years ago and it's just been replaced by an all new model with a new chassis and a fancy all wheel drive system. There's even a new hybrid e-performance version with even more power on the way too. And you can bet there'll be a Black Series version of that car along at some point. But until then, let's find out how much fun I can have in this particular AMG monster. Welcome to me looking like a complete net of idiots in a helmet and a hair protector thingy. <laughs> So I've got to wear this for safety's sake, obviously going out on track now, and I've got my harness on. It feels like a pretty serious beast already. I've got the car set up in race mode with the stability control on, just for the first few laps. We'll see how we get on. Hopefully it won't crash. Let's do this. Now I'm following some other cars out here, and in front is Bernd Schneider, who is a DTM touring car legend. So he'll be going at about 50% and I'll be going at about 110%. Right, I think I'm going to change gears myself because race car for the road. You've got to win, yeah. Oh, blimey. I'll tell you what, straight away, the front end on this is well tidy. The way it grips, oh, they've really made some significant changes to this car and you can feel them. It's got that race car feel to it. So much more information is coming through the steering than I recall from a GT or the GTR Pro. This bit's a bit sketch. Get this wrong with this wall. You've got to trust those tires. But they're good tires, specifically developed for this car. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a beast, an absolute beast of a machine. <laughs> you can probably hear my radio just like rattling around in the cup holder. <laughs> Some change in direction. That front end grip is phenomenal. <laughs> Be brave, don't lift, don't lift, keep it on, keep it on. Whoa. Get this one right, Matt, come on, Matt. Yes. I tell you what, when you get into a rhythm with this, it's absolutely gorgeous. They have done a great job. Whoa, it's just sliding slightly there. I think I might have cut that up a bit. Oh no. This is the tricky one for me, this one here. You can just feel the nose just holding, 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 get out of it. And this engine kicking out 730 horses. Woo. Cool down lap for the car and <laughs> cool down lap for the presenter. Fast front engine cars can sometimes be a bit leery on track. Thankfully, all the aero upgrades on the GT Black Series make up for all this. But how does a mid-engine car like the 765 LT feel with its own raft of aero modifications? One thing I like about McLarens is the steering feel. Part of that is helped by the thin wheel. BMWs, for instance, have overly fat wheels, so you don't get such a sensation through your hands. <laughs> this thing shifts like crazy, but it doesn't just shift well. These brakes are immense. Tightens the car beautifully. You really do feel exactly what's going on through your bottom. And you can adjust it if you get it wrong. It's very adjustable, this. Got to stay brave here. Yes. The punch from the engine really does stand out. You always just seem to be on boost. That must be something to do with the fact that you're, whoa. 
Nice slide there. You've got a lower final drive, gearing's shorter, and the ratios are closer than in the normal 720S. So you really do notice that. Means that when you're going through corners, you're actually in a higher gear than you'd otherwise normally be in. Oh, the traction out of the turns is so good. I've got to be honest with you though, this car is potentially a little bit too quick for me right now. It's something that if you're lucky enough to be able to buy one, you are going to want to get some time on track with an instructor to really get the most out of it. Oh. I'll tell you one thing I like about McLarens is they always judge their traction control just so blooming well. So it gives you a little bit of play, a little bit of slip, but it's there to help you out. Oh, there's gear shifts, they're just like instant, instant, instant. If you buy one of these, please take it on track. Don't just have it as a collector's piece. You'll be missing out. Oh, a bit of a tank slapper. <laughs> now, of course, if you do, make sure you've got it short, <laughs> just in case you make it there a lot. Like now, I've covered front and mid-engine cars. Let's complete the setup with a rear-engine car, the 911 GT3 RS. But before I drive it, I have to do a bit of Porsche admin. This GT3 RS is more configurable than any other 911 before it. So when you put it into track mode, you can then access different functions such as the suspension, and you can alter the compression and rebound damping individually. Completely crazy. Press this button to access the Porsche torque vectoring, and you can alter the amount of torque vectoring you get going into a corner or out of it, so you can make the car more stable or a little bit more agile. You can press this button to alter the traction control or the stability control. And you know what that means. Okay, like the Porsche man says, let's have a proper drive in this thing because it's about the handling, not necessarily the straight line speed, even though that's very good. Whoa! The front end on this is just epic! <laughs> and then the traction you get from the rear axle. Oh! It's just so solid. I mean, you have to be going proper speeds to really get that aero working. And this is quite a narrow little track, so I can't go too crazy. But my God, you don't all feel part of the car. And it feels like a proper racing car with the squeaking from the brakes and the howling from the engine. I'm loving the gear shifter though. This magnetically actuated click. What oh, a good click. Wow, this is so good. Oh, weight grips. Whoa, it's blooming bonkers. Last car I drove around here was the GT4 RS. Lovely car, but this, this is definitely its bigger brother. This is an absolute weapon. Get this thing on a proper racing circuit, it will blow your mind. And I just love the 911 setup, you know, with the engine at the rear. You drive them in a certain way, they've got so much character. I can't believe it's got more downforce than a GT3 Cup car. But while you will take this car on track, you're also going to want to have fun with it on a twisty country road, aren't you? So let's try it in that environment now. So I'm in track mode, but I'm going to go into sport mode now, which will slacken things off just a little bit, make it feel a little less extreme, though it's still pretty extreme. <laughs> Yeah, the suspension is a little bit more yielding. Let me just go for these bumps. It's like a test track. Oh, oh, and they've got these bumps. Oh, no, get out of that. Which are designed to test the car suspension. This car is so stiff that even with the suspension in the softer setting, it's still oh, pretty jarring. But actually, over undulations and normal bumps, the damping is very good, considering you've got such firm springs. Oh. 
it's so nice to drive this, just blowing down a twisty road. Feels fabulous. Yeah, there's carbon ceramics. That's one reason why you might not want them because they can feel a bit grabby when you first touch the pedal and you get this squeaking sound. But if you're going to be on track a lot, they're definitely worth considering because the brakes will just hold out for longer. You don't need them on the road though. Oh, this thing. <laughs> and all the revs, running out of road before revs. <laughs> I tell you one thing you don't really run out of either is confidence. Like the car just feels so stable. Yet at the same time, it's also extremely responsive. And obviously Porsche's stability management system is just so good at letting the car move around a bit, but just keeping everything nice and safe. <laughs> and the amount of grip you get, go around the corners and then traction out of the bends is just insane. You can feel that front axle just biting in, and then the rear just putting the power down. <laughs> oh, you can drive this thing so quickly on a twisty road. Anyway, what happens when you're having to get to your twisty road? You know, just normal driving. Let's go into drive, normal mode. Actually, though, I've heard the best thing to do is to go back into track mode, get on your suspension button and dial it all the way down to the softest setting. And then that should be the most relaxing drive. Well, so long as you haven't got sporty mode for the gearbox, you have to change gears yourself. So now I'm going over some bumpy bits here and yeah, you do feel the bumps. It's not terrible and I'd happily live with it in order to have a car such as this. The key thing is, it's not unbearable, but what about when you're cruising on the motorway? Okay, cruising on the motorway, 120 kilometers an hour, which is about 70 miles an hour. I uh, think this is perfectly acceptable. I cannot hear any slight droning sound or wind noise or tire noise at all. Oh, actually I can, but I don't really care because I've got a Porsche 911 GT3 RS and life is good. Also, I can press this button to engage DRS. Yes. I feel the drag reduce. That'll entertain me on a longer journey. Actually, I know what else could entertain me. Let's have a listen to this engine. I wonder how fast it'll go in first gear. 80 kilometers an hour at the red line. What about in second gear? 125 kilometers an hour. I wonder what third gear is. 171 kilometers an hour. <laughs> That's the kind of thing I would do <laughs> when driving on the motorway. <laughs> I think I'm slightly deaf now. The time has come to talk numbers. How much do these cars cost? Well, the cheapest car on my list is the Corvette Z06. In the USA, it costs $100,000, but it's so popular that some dealers have been charging people a $50,000 premium. Now, dealers won't be allowed to do that in the UK because that's just not cricket. Although, once someone bought the car and sold it back to them, they can. Anyhow, Chevrolet hasn't confirmed how much the car will cost in the UK, but don't expect to get any change from £100,000. In fact, it's gonna be more than that. Now, let's move on to the Nissan GTR Nismo. You see, this Nissan costs £180,000, which is just insane. Next up is the 911 GT3 RS. Now, it did start at just under £180,000, but recent price rises means that it's over £190,000 before you fit any kit to it. At today's prices, for a fully loaded one with all the bits you really want, you're looking at £250,000 for a Vicep pack car with nose lift, reversing camera and carbon ceramic brakes. That is a lot of cash, but luckily GT3 RSs hold their value. In fact, they've gone up in value. They are currently trading for around £300,000 to £350,000 on the used market. The next car on my list is the McLaren 765LT, which cost £280,000 when it was new. Now, it hasn't gone up in value as much as the 911 GT3 RS. You can get a used one for about £290,000. Still pretty expensive, you think? Well, at least it's less than an AMG GT Black Series. A used one of those now is about £360,000. Though new, they were £335,000. So, yep, they've gone up in value as well. Coincidentally, that £360,000 is exactly what a Lamborghini SVJ cost when it was new. But they have appreciated too. 
and they are the most expensive car to buy used today. A second-hand SVJ is worth more than £430,000. Well, so long as the previous owner took good care of it. <coughs> Only joking, Mark. I know you take good care of your cars, even if you never clean them. So, how do I feel about buying my 911 GT3 RS? Well, it isn't the easiest of the track-focused supercars to live with, and some people won't like the way it looks. But I don't care. I absolutely love it. It's more accessible than the McLaren 765LT. It's more precise than the AMG GT Black Series. It's quicker than the Corvette Z06. It's more dramatic than the GTR Nismo, and it gives you more confidence to drive hard than an Aventador SVJ. In fact, I wouldn't change anything about it. Well, apart from the fact it doesn't have a front boot. That's a bit of a downer. Oh well. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like. Let me know what you think of it in the comments below. If you want to watch some more videos, I've picked a couple out for you there. I think you'll like it. Just click on those windows to watch them. Or if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. You can do that just by hitting the Carwell logo there. Simple.